This Saturday. Giveaway. That's right. And chaos. And chaos. <laughs> in case you haven't looked back there recently, in the last day or two, you can't get in the doors, are There's so much, even from Sunday, there's so much more back there now than there was Sunday. I spoke with Brother Bob. They're having a meeting, and then they have their they have their Bible study back there, the manual congregation, the same time we do. And uh, about the ministry opportunity this Saturday, and uh, we need some help with language sometimes, and some of their congregants can come and share with us in that and help uh, in that way. And then Thanksgiving meal, which is also coming up, it's our worship service, uh, the Sunday right before Thanksgiving, I believe normally it's the Sunday prior, is that right? Or, some, or the Sunday right before that. It is a great time of uh, coming together 
we usually meet with Emmanuel's congregation in this room. We come together, we eat together, and we just share in a popcorn kind of style. Just stand where you are and share things that you're thankful for. It's just the way to, to turn around and go back to the Lord. Remember the ten lepers, only one turned around and go back to the Lord and say thank you for what you've done this past year. That's what that service is all about. We have some simple songs, maybe some choruses that we're working on even now. But most, and we fellowship and we have some great food for Baptists so we can. But that's go. not, the dinner is not after church, it's at 6 o'clock. It, it is, it is uh, 6 or 6.30, I forgot. Six. Anyway, so yeah. It is our Sunday evening, it is, well, for, the, for Emmanuel, it is their service. Uh, we don't usually meet on Sunday evenings, but it's, it's. Everybody comes together at the same time. Yeah. So keep those things in mind. But this Saturday, it starts at 8, but we have to start way before 8 to get here by 6 o'clock. And we'll carry everything over to put it under the tent and get everything set up and ready to go. There are still some lines that are blank on the soup registry. The soup and chili. Most of it's taken, but there's still some empty slots if you can... Just bring a crock pot full of soup or chili, that'd be great. That goes in the picnic shelter, and that too will start as soon as we get everything going at 8, I guess. And when the food runs out, it runs out. But everything is free, and I would encourage you, because there are going to be multiple people that will say, how much is this? How much is free? And they'll look at you just like that and say, well, mm -hmm. but how much is this? It's free too. And they're going to say, well, at least take a donation. It's supposed to be free. Okay? Don't make somebody mad. But it's supposed to be free. We've taken donations in the past because people were adamant about it. If they do, um, just get it in the right hands. Uh, one of the deacons or Sandy or Diane's or Treasure or somebody, one of the leaders. Um, but we try to just discourage them from giving anything because for a lot of people, in the community, they think everything that takes place in the church costs you something. So they got to pay for it. We're trying to get away from that and just tell them. And they will say, why are you doing this? Because God loves us and God's blessed us and we want to love and bless you the same way. Which opens that door to that next conversation you're going to have with them. Is this is, you know, we're just trying to meet a need, but we also understand that God is our source. Our ultimate source. And you'd be surprised at the response that you'll get from folks or how they'll open up to, well, I, I'm really struggling right now. My family's going through this. And that's a good opportunity to say, I'd love to pray for you. How can we, you know, we're not there to push membership home. I'd love for them to join. That's not it. We're there to, to, to minister and to love them and to present the kingdom to them. If they want to become part of Homewood, that would be an icing on the cake. But we want them to be part of the kingdom. And to know that there's Jesus has feet and hands, and that's us. Okay. So, any questions? And we'll stop at one. This is not an all-day deal. We'll stop at one o'clock. Um, I doubt that. Clean up <laughs> and, uh, and move on. We will leave the tent set up and the stuff out there. We did that last year, and that's how some of our folks are here now. Um, they'll come by during the week, first couple days of the week at least, and after that. It all goes to one place or other, whatever's left. So, Are you going to run the train? I don't know if my back's going to take the train again this year. Um, I think it's still available if somebody else wants to run it, but um, it's pretty rough on your back. There's Did you get the emergency vehicles? We're working on that. We found out we had to go through a website in the county and, and fill out a request for them to bring the vehicles here. Uh, there will be some show cars here, classic cars. Um, Hopefully a fire truck and a police car and so forth. Maybe people are going to stop just because they think something's going on at Homewood. So, uh, we'll see. But it's a great outreach. So plan on being here. And and please plan on staying until 1 o'clock to help clean up, to help if we have tables and chairs out there to bring them back in, whatever we need to do. It's not an all-day affair, but it's a very important thing. And it will take time. So... Y'all have some prayer requests tonight, some names we need to add to our list? <laughs> um, yes, Ms. Elise? Yesterday, and he was like, Whatever. And today, he was trying to get his, himself to 
Smith, and she mentioned struggling to breathe. Continue to remember, continue to remember Laura Haruska. She is at home, but she is still struggling to breathe. And um, is she alone? no, she lives with her mother and a friend, mom's friend. Um, and she today just taking a shower or walking to the kitchen. Uh, it's all she can do. And she's on oxygen. She has a CPAP machine at night, but she's really struggling. Um, so continue to pray for her. Also continue to pray for Cameron Harrington. Um, as we laid hands on him and pray for Carrington, uh, Cameron, so continue to pray for he and his family. But Talk about Laura for just a second. Uh, you know, most of the time I have no idea of the talent that we have right here. I had no idea she she is very talented and she's been through more medical issues and it's just amazing she's still going picking beads, cleaning the house doing whatever she can do did you visit her when she was tearing it up the only way you knew she played organ or yes, yeah, one sure. day when I went to visit or to get her to see David I heard the organ when I got out of the vehicle and she was playing there now other prayer concerns, praises? A praise. My sister Carol uh -huh. um, is out of the hospital. She's in Ohio right now, but she's going to try to move to the beach. Okay. With her daughter. So. That'd be good. What's her last name? Argenzio. Oh, right, there it is. Okay. At the top. That's great. Praise. Thank you, Barbara, your sister. 
And David was supposed to try to go back to work this week. I don't know if he has. I hadn't got a response okay. yet. So that would be a praise. David Fullwood. Yes. George, you have a praise? You told me about your David. You yeah, my nephew David. David, David nephew, yeah. yeah. He, um, he was even scared before to even drive because the uh, last time he drove, he passed out by lucky enough his wife was with him. But uh, he's back driving. He's looking healthy. He shot himself a deer yesterday. He, he just he just feels like he's alive. Uh, yeah. he's, What's his last name? Harris. Harris. Um, I don't know if y'all remember or not, but we prayed a lot for David uh, for many months. And yeah, we thought we were going to lose him. Yes. You know, I did not think, I told him today, I said, I didn't think I was going to see him yeah. alive. So for him to make a trip down to visit with them and do some outdoors things, and it's, it's miraculous. So that's, yeah. I need to praise the Lord for that. But they did not think he was going to live. Yeah. But our prayers and all that, he, he's very grateful for all our prayers. Any others? I have a prize for Renee. She went back to work. That's great. Renee Hahn or Renee? Renee Hahn. And Renee Nobles is supposed to be starting some radiation. Okay. I have the right slope, Sam. Let me read my right. <laughs> So, what do you say about Renee Nobles? Renee Nobles is supposed to start radiation, radiation um, to help with some of the pain. Okay. Thank you. They can pray it our giveaway stuff if you want somebody picking it up. That's right. That's right. Um, Terry Cap. You know Terry Capps? Mm -hmm. um, pray for Terry and her family. She's been diagnosed with brain cancer mm -hmm. and has just come home to uh, spend some time with her family. Uh, she's, they live down on 905, and several years ago we were praying for her daughter. She had something, they didn't know what it was, and uh, she almost passed away. She's back to health, but now her mom, uh, who used to shadow one of the young girls at Kingston for years, um, but anyway, Terry is is the one diagnosed with brain cancer and has come home to spend some time with family. So pray for that family, Terry Cat. My mom moved into her apartment yesterday. Um, continue to pray for her and her adjustment there and new location and new way to get around and her neighbors and all the things there. So. Can you give me her phone number? No. <laughs> uh, she is she is getting a landline. Oh, uh, yesterday we didn't have the number yet, but yes, be glad for y'all to give her a call. Uh, yes. Any others? I had two yeah. classmates that passed away this past week: Joan Adams, okay, and also Al McGinn. So Joan Adams family and Al. Jerry? Yes, uh, last week Elise uh, saw these two movies. She said, Jerry, you gotta see these movies. I, I love to see them. It's either, uh, what is it, Netflix or Freebie? They're inspirational. Right. It, it, the one's called Running the Bases, and the other one is uh, Playing the Flute. And they were both about Jesus Christ. Yeah. I can't take credit for this. I was writing my co workers' notes on a piece of paper. I wrote that I go, you'll really be blessed by these. Right. Please, please watch them when you can. Because we're all part time. We work two, three days a week. So I just praise Jesus for that opportunity. That's right, Terry. And you just never know. Um, the Lord can use all kinds of avenues uh, to get people's attention. And we talked about last night, I don't want to chase a rabbit here, but we talked about our Right Now Media membership um, for that reason, and that's one of the reasons we pay, what is it, $500 or something? We pay $100 a month, something like that. 
to have a membership to Right Now Media. Right Now Media is a huge database for Bible studies, adults, children, women, men, um, videos, movies, and it's all uh, Christian uh, material. Uh, we've used several Bible studies in the past on Wednesday nights from Right Now Media, but the cool thing is the church pays a membership. They encourage you to give it away to other people. Give them the login information. They can go right now media and utilize all of this information free to them. It is an outreach tool, and it, it's just what you said, Jerry. It's like you could see a Bible study there or watch a movie on right now media and it just have a, the best presentation of the gospel. And you can tell your neighbor or whatever, you need to watch this movie and it's free. Here's the login, and then they'll check it out, and they may see 10 other movies there that are Bible studies or whatever. But uh, we'll, I'll say more about that on Sundays, but it's right now media, and it's free to you. The church pays the membership, and it's free to give away to your neighbors, and that's that's what the company pushes. But that's great, Jerry. That's, that's certainly a prayer. Helen is asking for prayer for Ronnie and Patricia Roberts. She says they both have cancer. Helen Hurl. No. Or Helen Hardwick. Helen Hardwick, I'm sorry. What are those names again? Ronnie and Patricia Roberts. Okay. Ronnie and Patricia Roberts. Thank you, Ms. Helen. We pray for you, Judy. Okay. Any others? And I'm talking about Christian liter uh, literature and, and studies like that. I saw a sign downtown today for a Christian bookstore that's opening. Really? It's on Wall Street. I've kind of oh, lost one. Um, Stella's ice cream. Barbara saw a sign downtown that said there's a Christian bookstore coming. I thought all those were gone. Um, that would be great. Okay. Let me pray with you. And then we'll dive into uh, the Word and what we're studying tonight. Can I have anything to pray for our Christian men that's in leadership roles? Yes. And we mentioned uh, about the deacons and the new team leaders. And we certainly do need to pray. Thank you, James. Um, that's a big, a big thing. It's important to the health of this church. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence. And thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you. It is such a gift that we can approach the throne. Enter into the Holy of Holies only because the blood sacrifice was made. Because of Jesus, we can approach the throne. Lord, I thank you for every day, the things that you give us and do for us and the, the light that you shine in us and through us and the way that you lead us and guide us and your forgiveness and your grace and in your admonition and discipline. As your word says, that you're a loving father, therefore you discipline those whom you love. Father, thank you for those times as well. We pray that you would be with those we mentioned tonight by name. You know their circumstance, their struggles, their distress. You know their victories and the excitement in their lives. I pray that you would uh, pour out your presence in their homes and their families and that they would trust you and turn to you and rely on you for their source and their being their Lord and their Savior. Father, I pray that you would use us as a congregation to continue to further the kingdom by spreading the gospel, making disciples, uh, showing people by our actions and our words and our temperament what it means to be spirit-filled, God-controlled, and submitted to your presence and authority in our lives. Lord, I thank you for each person that's here tonight, those that are watching on Facebook, and those in this room. I pray that you be with Emmanuel's congregation as they're meeting just behind us in the other rooms back here, that you would grow them as well, and um, that they would continue to serve you. I pray that you would use us together to reach out to this community, even this Saturday, that this would be a time of blessing for those that come, a time maybe of, of being introduced to Jesus Christ for the first time, maybe hearing the gospel for the first time. I pray that you would use us to honor you and this Saturday in particular, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, we're talking about Israel. Uh, more poignantly, we've been talking about Jerusalem. Last uh, two weeks ago, we started talking about the importance of Jerusalem in Scripture. Um, Jerusalem is is talked about in the Old Testament and New Testament. It was 
it, it's um, especially important uh, back in the Old Testament and and we see Jesus doing uh, most of his ministry there around that area. Uh, in the future, we, we see Jesus coming back to earth, the same place that he, that he ascended from. And it's just a very important place. Um, here, uh, as of late, we've been discussing and reading and praying for Israel as a whole and the things that they're undergoing. I don't want to... Um, speak of uh, political things necessarily, but I do want you to, uh, that if you want to have a background of what's been going on in Israel for the last hundred years, there are some speakers um, that you can look up on YouTube or you can Google it or whatever that will give you an accurate uh, history lesson of here's where Palestine came from. Here's why it's called Palestine. It's just a, kind of a dig to the Jewish folks there. Here's where the where the West Bank is and why it's called that, and, and here's where the Gaza Strip is, and here's all these these countries that surround Israel and their Arab backgrounds and, and the Muslim uh, influence there, and all the things that, that have gone on in the last several years. One string that you will see that runs through all of this is Israel's miraculous ability to. Uh, be humble in their uh, and contentment in their home and their home place, but the ability to defend when necessary with a might that is just divine. It's just unheard of, especially for some something that's that small. There are several things that have happened uh, over the years to where they pushed people back so far that were attacking them. Anyway, I won't get into all that, but if you want to know who I'm talking about that gives a, an accurate depiction of this. Ask me afterwards. He is Jewish himself, um, and he lives in the States, but gives a very detailed depiction of what's happened there in the last several years, and this certainly needs to be prayed for the folks there, all those that are being affected by the war and everything going on there. And it certainly will play a part, Israel will play a part in the prophecy that we've been talking about, in particular Jerusalem. Two weeks ago, we talked about Jerusalem present day. We talked about its, its uh, significance in the past, significance in the future. But I want to back you up to the, the latter part of this video that speaks of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. Heaven. Okay? What that means to us. Um, the significance of the new Jerusalem. Does that mean... I'm looking forward to my mansion. I'm looking forward to seeing my loved ones. I'm looking forward to the Crystal River. I probably have family members try to fish out of that river. I don't know. There's a lot of things you can be looking forward to. But one of the things that Dr. Jeremiah points to is the significance of the New Jerusalem is the presence of Jesus. And that being the most important thing. And then he ties that into the importance that the church has. It's not about a religion. Um, I believe, um, if I speak accurately of, of some of the things there in Jerusalem today, it's not uh, something that, uh, there are places there that even the Jewish folks can't go and pray like they've always been able to do, but other religions can. There's a struggle for, for property, there's a struggle for, I'm claiming this piece of dirt and that piece of dirt, it goes back to what the Lord said and who He gave it to struggle. There's always been struggle there. And there's some symbolism there as far as our struggle and the struggle that we have spiritually in the territory and the property within us that belongs to God that when we're born, it's born with a sin nature and there's this fight over property rights. Who owns us? Who gets to dictate our lives and to direct our lives? And so there's, there's a lot going on there with the importance of God's territory. His people and His promises. Are you looking forward to being in heaven one day? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to worry about self. You think, well, that wasn't on my list. Well, it's on mine. You won't have to worry about sinful self. You struggle with that. Paul did. I know what to do, but I find myself not. I know what I shouldn't do, but that's what I find myself doing. That struggle with self won't be there. Satan won't be there. This physical body that just keeps on giving up. 
it won't be present in the same condition. Um, there's a lot of things that we struggle with on a daily basis that will not be there. But most importantly, what will be there is our Lord. And unhindered from this distance that we seem to have sometimes with Him, even though He's, He lives in our hearts, uh, there won't be that continual struggle. But anyway, I want you to listen to this latter part of the video. I'm just replaying the last, I think it's 15 minutes of it, so you'll be reminded of what we talked about two weeks ago. And then we're going to go to 2 Peter, and then we're going to go to the 24th chapter of Matthew, both of which talk about the end times and the passage that we actually went over this past Sunday in Romans 8. Um, I think it was in verses, was it 25? Somewhere around verse 25 um, that we talked about that word that I always want you to learn, the Greek word, it's an eager awaiting. It's used here in these scriptures that we go to tonight. And it says that the believer should always be eagerly waiting for the second coming, uh, looking forward to the new Jerusalem. So keep those things in mind. I'm going I'm to show you this video. Uh, pay close attention. And then we'll answer some questions. We only have one more lesson as far as this video series. And it's talking about the success of the gospel, the ultimate success of the gospel. Uh, we'll, Lord willing, we'll visit that next week. But look at this part of the video, and then we'll answer some questions. Steve, yes. one more thing. <laughs>
But not only must we pray for the internal culture of Israel, we must pray for the international safety of Israel. Modern Israel has been faced and forced to maintain a continual state of warfare almost throughout its entire existence. Some have described living in Israel as a very nice house in a very bad neighborhood. <laughs> Israel is in a fight for its very survival, and not everybody is sympathetic to them. We've noticed in this country, even in recent days and months, a, a greater sense of anti-Semitism than we've had in the past. It's a growing thing. It should frighten us because, you know, the Bible says, God will bless those who bless Israel, and he will curse those who curse Israel. If we take a stand against Israel, if we don't support them, if we're not Israel's friends, we put ourselves in great jeopardy. If you don't think Israel is under hostility, I'm going to tell you something that I know you wouldn't hear anyplace else because nobody will tell you this. You'll be joking by this as I was. Listen. This statistic comes from the United Nations. Israel has been the single most discriminated against state at the United Nations. So here's the statistics. From 2012 through 2019, the United Nations has made 202 resolutions criticizing other countries. Israel was the subject of 163 of those 202 resolutions. 81% of the resolutions against other countries by the United Nations is against Israel. Now, you and I know that's not possible. That couldn't be real. Israel is responsible for 81% of the hostility in the world today? That's not true. But it is true that it represents the hostility that the world still has for this little nation we call Israel. So let me tell you again. Pray for Israel. They count on us as their prayer partners. I hope you will join me in doing that. Number two, stay faithful in your service and in your ministry. Second Peter 3, 11 and 12 says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and see its coming. Peter said, since it's true that God's going to renovate this earth, it's not going to be destroyed, but it's going to be cleansed. And it's going to all be made new. We hear about the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down. Peter says, since all this is true, what kind of people should we be? Here is Peter telling us where do we go from here. And this is what he's saying. This ought to solicit within us a greater sense of holiness and godliness than ever before. There's an old adage that says that sanctification, which is to be holy, sanctification is defined like this. It is being in practice what you already are in position. The Bible says that when we accept Christ, we get the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So before God, we're just as righteous as Jesus is. But the reality is we still have to live on this earth and our responsibility is to live our lives in such a way that we are living as if we really are holy. We're to live lives that are representative of the holiness which God has given us. Oh, how important that is today. Because we are being surrounded with evil as never before. And it has never been more important that we as Christians refuse to live our lives in a lie and live our lives in the truth of who we are in Jesus Christ. So stay fervent in your prayer for Israel. And then stay focused on Israel and Jerusalem. Today, the largest country in the world by population is China. China has 1.5 billion people. Of the 193 countries in the world, Israel is in the bottom half in terms of its citizens. It has a population of 9 million. That's less than 1% of China's population. Israel is 1% of China's population. And yet, Israel's international influence 
far outweighs the number of people that are living there. The New York Times reported that Israel is the seventh most mentioned country in their newspaper, just behind Russia, England, and Germany, and way ahead of much larger countries like Japan, India, and Italy. And you know that. You can't listen to the news without Israel being mentioned. It's in all the writings, it's in all of the news shows. And as you witness the United States Embassy being moved to Jerusalem, you see again that Israel's at the center of the geopolitical world. Along with that are all of these nations which have now become a part of the Abraham Accords. You probably know about this. The United Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan, all Arab nations have made accords with Israel and they now are trading with them and working with them and they've drawn close to Israel. I understand that there are more of these nations on the way. Gradually, over the past decade, the fault lines have moved. Until recently, the Middle East has been everybody against Israel. Israel was public enemy number one in the eyes of all of her neighbors. 37 nations around Israel wanted to kill them. But as Iran has pounded its chest and rattled its sword, it's become obvious that the greatest threat to existence in the Middle East is no longer the little nation of Israel. It's the aggressive, radical, Islamic terrorist nation of Iran. So Iran doesn't just represent radical Islam. They represent apocalyptic Islam. They envision end-of-the-world scenarios. While the Palestinian controversy still exists, as you know, the Palestinians are very upset with the embassy being in Jerusalem. The Palestinian situation is in some ways being put on the back burner as the Arabic nations create coalitions with Israel in their defense against Iran. According to the U.S. News and World Report, Israel is the 10th most powerful nation in the world. And it is certainly the most powerful military force in the Middle East. But the leadership of Iran is plotting and the neighborhood is nervous. So keep your eyes on the chessboard of the Middle East. Follow the news from there. Become an expert on the land that God has marked as the flashpoint of prophecy. Many people around the world have enjoyed the wit and personality of Kathy McGifford, who has been a TV host on Regis and Kathy, as well as the Today Show. What many people don't know is that Kathy Lee is a dedicated student of the Bible, a huge evangelical fan of Israel. In her words, my love affair with the land of Israel began the moment I took my very first step onto the Promised Land in June of 1971. She writes, I was 17 years old, and my father's high school graduation gift to me was a trip for me and my mother to attend the first Jerusalem conference on biblical prophecy. I missed my graduation ceremony, but I couldn't have cared less. I was there where it all happened, and all the stories I had heard, all the scriptures I had studied since I was a young girl, everything I believed from the Word of God had taken place thousands of years in this land, and I was there experiencing it for the very first time. That thought took my breath away all those years ago, she wrote, and it still does today. Like me, Kathy Lee Gifford has been a frequent visitor to Israel. She even wrote a book called The Rock, The Road, and Rabbi, My Journey into the Heart of Scriptural Faith and the Land Where It All Began. That book hit the New York Times bestselling list. One trip in particular was especially memorable that was when Kathy Lee's husband, Frank Gifford, agreed to join her in Israel for the first time. Frank had grown up in poverty, and he later became a very famous football player and TV announcer. He also was a man of faith, or at least he thought he was. According to Kathy Lee, what Frank didn't realize until our trip to Israel is that he had a religion all of his life, but he never had a relationship with the living God. During that trip, the group visited the Valley of Elah, where David fought Goliath. The leader explained that the miracle of that story was not David's victory over the giant. After all, David had already defeated the lion and the bear. 
And it said the miracle of that story was David's genuine personal relationship with Almighty God. The leader then instructed everyone in the group to go down to the same road David had visited and pick up a stone. He asked, what is your stone? Where are you going to throw it? In Kathy Lee's words, I will never forget the look in Frank's eyes as this man who was in six halls of fame obediently reached down to pick up his stone, just as a young shepherd boy had done 3,000 years ago. This experience lit a fire in my belly, and it satisfied a deep longing in Frank's soul. Though the rest of the trip was profoundly moving and illuminating, it was this truth he learned in the Valley of Elah, that religion is nothing without relationship. That gave Frank a strong sense of peace and purpose until the day he died, and finally, at the age of 82, he had found his son. What I learned from this is Jerusalem is the center of religion, but Jesus Christ is the center of faith. Don't go to your grave a religious person. Go to your grave a Christian person. Go to heaven. Don't go to the other place. Don't live all of your life under the facade of being a religious person, as Frank Gifford did. Find Jesus Christ in a personal way. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Invite Him to come and forgive your sin and receive Him into your life. And you will be a person who has a relationship, not a religion. Relationship is what gets you to heaven. Religion will fool you into thinking you're going there and you will be disappointed at the end. So my appeal to you today is this. Make sure Jesus Christ is not only the center of Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem, but that He is the center of your life because you have put Him on the throne of your heart. in the United States here lately is whoever's giving money and subsidizing Iran's activities usually is the ones that um, are hurting Israel the most. But we do need to pray. What I want to focus on the la this last little bit, I uh, want you to be able to ask some questions, is what he ended with. Jerusalem is the center, the hub of religion all over the world. Jerusalem is where people want to be. It's, it's the hub of Judaism. It's the hub of Christianity. It's the hub of Islam. They all claim this territory. That's that's the sacred place. And David Jeremiah made a, 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 a point here to say that it is not about religion. It's about a relationship. And just as Jerusalem is the center of all these religions, Jesus must be the center of our relationship with Christianity. I know that we all come from different backgrounds. It used to be back in the day when, when we were kids, if we were part of a Methodist church, then everybody there grew up Methodist. If we were part of a Baptist church, everybody there would have been Baptist, and, and so on and so forth. It was heritage. Your family went to the same church, same denomination, whatever, forevermore. That is not the case anymore, and we all come from different backgrounds and different beliefs, and, and having to remind, be reminded of that on a weekly basis, I want you to note that beyond any doubt that Jesus must be the center of our heart and our relationship, uh, our heaven is, is never going to be a reality for us. It is not about a religion. It is about a relationship. And there's so much symbolism in the specialness of Jerusalem and the specialness of Jesus and his place in our hearts, just like Jerusalem is a special place in all the the powerful world religions are the three most, uh, the largest in the world. Uh, Jesus must be the center. Um, when he started this thing, he was talking about a new Jerusalem, and 
talking about what heaven must be like. You ever think about that? What's heaven like? There's no cats there. I know that for a fact. Yes, yes, there are. No, they, they don't go to. I just read something from David Jeremiah about animals in heaven. Oh, no, we're different. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. If Laura was here, she'd be throwing things. I ain't never had the two pieces of gold in my life. And I don't understand about the gold streets up there. I had two rings, and Judy Melvin from my hospital rang down, and I give my other ring to my grandson. Mm -hmm. Gold don't impress me. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, there's only one street in heaven. It's a gold transparent gold street, one street. I think the reason it says that is we'd be, won't be on Main Street instead of Back Street. There'd be some kind of fleshly desire to be up front. I want you to understand this about heaven is that, do you know what it, I, I, this is probably a bad example, but it's one that I can relate to and I know that a lot of you can as well. You ever been to the hospital and they put you on, on the, the IV bag and you've been there for a while and you find yourself, I'm really not thirsty, but you haven't had anything to drink in a while. Sometimes you want ice chips. But I've been in that situation sometimes and I think, well, I haven't eaten or a drunk thing in a while, but I really I'm not hungry because you're getting some kind of nutrients uh, or nutrients, <laughs> some kind of uh, whatever through whatever they're giving you. The desire to eat may be uh, dep depleted, not because you've eaten, but because you're getting your body's getting what it needs. When you enter into heaven, <clears throat> there won't be a when I get there. I, I'm going to do this and look for that and, and go here because you won't show up with a shopping list of I'm not fulfilled unless I see this person. I'm not fulfilled unless I get to do this or I'm not fulfilled unless my house is next to there won't That's fleshly. There won't be any of that. God will satisfy. He will take care of all of our needs all at once. You will be completely satisfied, overjoyed, thrilled to death when you show up, you understand what I'm saying? All of your deep voids and needs and brokenness and all the things that, that you are longing for, they will all instantaneously be met. Otherwise, heaven's not heaven as it's described in Scripture. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, and I don't want to trace the chase of rabbit, but heaven is a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place. And I want you to think about that. In the scripture, it talks about we should be looking forward, really anticipating, excited about what it's going to be. Do y'all have some, before we go to the scripture, do y'all have some questions about maybe what you saw there or from two weeks ago, something that we discussed on the subject? <laughs> y'all are never this quiet. While she's getting ready, I'm going to go back to the first two verses that he mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 3. If you'll look at 2 Peter chapter 3, actually I'm going to read three verses, uh, starting in verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up, since all, uh, all these things uh, are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for, there's that, there's that anticipation, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will be melt, uh, melt with intense heat, but according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's the description of heaven. Righteousness dwells there. Nothing that we're struggling with right now in and of ourselves in this world, in this culture. And I've heard a lot of people say, I just can't wait to get out of here. Well, I understand that. But let's take some folks with us, okay? Let's take some folks with us in the way of preparing them, putting them in the lifeboat, saying, hey, you're headed to destruction. Let's not be so eager to get there alone and just show up. And God say, well, where's the disciples that I commanded you to make? Well, I got here. Well, that's great, but... We're the disciples that I commanded you to make. So we need to be bringing folks with us. Any questions yet? <laughs> Comments? Uh, comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just, I, I'm just trying to remember who the woman speaker um, saw on YouTube. 
that she's speaking to a, a crowd, and, and clearly many of them were non-believers, and said, you know, but why do Christians just have to shove it down our throats? Why can't you just believe what you believe and leave us alone? And she used this analogy that I really, really like. She said, okay, imagine I invite you over, and I you know, serve dinner, and we're having a nice social time, and my dog has to go out. So I, I say, I'll be right back, and I take my dog out to relieve himself, and there's a snake in the yard. And so I'll bring my, my dog back in, and but I don't tell you. And a few minutes later, you, the non-believer, want to go out and get some fresh air, and I just let you go. And you go out, and you're bit by the snake, and you come back in and say, why didn't you tell me? And that's why we tell you, because we know what's out there, and if we don't tell you, you know, you're, you're going to get bit. And I, I just really like that analogy. It's true. We have to rem remember, we're left here for a reason. From the time we place our faith in, in Christ, we're left here for a reason. And he tells us what that is. You know, if you love me, you're going to, as he told Peter, you feed my sheep. If you love me, you're going to spread the gospel. You're going to make disciples. So let's, let's bring some folks with us as we're ready to go and looking forward to it. Let's, let's do all that we can to deliver the message. The Holy Spirit does the change and transform, but deliver the message. Go to, go to Matthew 24. If you would, Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. It says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, uh, fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. He's coming back. It says that he's coming back. Uh, I told you there was one more passage, actually the one that we used this past Sunday in Romans chapter 8. And I want you to go there if you would. Uh, Is that referring to the rapture? It's referring to both. Uh, second coming and... and Catching up of the elect. And that's a good thing we can talk about at some point is there's a second coming, not a third coming, a second coming. And we try to figure in sometimes where does the rapture happen and where does this happen? If you'll read the whole chapter there in Matthew 24, it, it lays it out. And there's places in the Revelation and Daniel that it does as well. But there's never mentioned a third coming. And some... Theologians will say this is an instantaneous thing. Some will say this difference of opinion. But, but he mentioned both there. He mentioned the second coming of the Lord and him sending to, to catch up the elect, to, to bring the elect to him. And that's a good question, Judy. It'll the take elect is, the church. is the church. Yes, the church. And we'll, that's something that we're going to talk about at length because it's a in-depth study. I may have passed that off to somebody else, but anyway. It's a good question. Go to Romans chapter 8, if you would. Chapter 8, verse 25. Um, actually, yeah, let's start with verse 23. Verse 23, chapter 8 of Romans. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Remember I told you it's like a down payment. The Scripture uh, points to that as the Holy Spirit living in us is like uh, earnest money is a down payment of what's to come. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly, and that's that, that Greek word, for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And there's a hint there that he comes back to get those who are waiting. And I share that with you Sunday. He's coming to get those who are waiting and ready and prepared. Remember I told you there's an analogy there that goes back to the days of Noah. When God shut the door. And after the door shut, now everybody figures out he was telling the truth. And they try, they try to get in. It was not up to people to open the door. God shut it. God will open it when the time comes. God's going to shut the door. So we have to be eagerly waiting and not uh, apathetic or or just kind of lackadaisical about 
He's coming back one day, but I got a lot going on, so I'll think about it later. We need to be ready. And people that are ready are, are going to be excited about what's coming, and they're going to tell other people, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about you know, what's coming, and, and I'm ready to go, and, and we'll talk about it. But if, if we just kind of camped out in the terminal, so to speak, and we set up home there in the terminal, and we forgot we got a flight to catch, we just kind of get enamored by the, all the stores, and we we'll miss our flight. You understand that? So it's the people that are eagerly waiting, and you say, well, what if I just uh, deviate from that a little bit? The, the, the message here is that if Christ is in us, if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, there should be some excitement. There should be a time of, of or a, a, this thing that we're looking forward to what's coming. There are going to be days that are going to be better than others. You know that. There are going to be times that we're more excited than we are others. But there's this, there's this constant, I can't wait. There's this constant, oh, that's going to be so great. There's this constant thing of, Oh, I just, it's just, it's coming. I know it's coming. And when that is present in your life and mine, I can't help but tell other people. There's something that just, when we have this giveaway, you, as believers in Christ, sure you're going to tell them, hey, if you're looking for a shirt or whatever, here's the shirt, just blah, 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 that's great. But in the back of your mind and in your heart, there's going to be this thing that says, that's going to, you know, that's only going to last you for a couple months, a couple years or whatever, but I may never see you again. And when you leave this planet, I know where you're headed, one or two places. And that's going to be in your mind and in your heart. And there's going to be something that's going to say, I, just tell me how I can pray for you. Or how's your family doing? Or can, can Homewood reach out to you in some way? There's going to be something of spiritual significance because you believe the day's coming. You believe that one day you'll enter into heaven. And you want other people to have that same opportunity. What else? Questions or comments? Sometimes God uses different tools. Um, Steve Cashin or David Jeremiah or even a Bill, Bill Graham. You can't crack ever enough. Uh, eight year old gentleman, but not all of them. Yeah. No, it's not important. Yeah. My focus was on my career. Same thing in a spiritual sense with an eight year old child, too, is what I'm trying to say. God can get you refocused. Oh, yes. God can use a lot of things to get our attention. That's for sure. Y'all ready to go to heaven? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, next Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll go to the final final video in this series and we'll talk about the gospel, the ultimate success of the gospel. And it's exciting. When we finish this study, Lord willing, we're going to start talking about holiness. And I'm going to take you through some things that Stephen Olford has uh, written and studied and um, what does holiness mean to us? David Jeremiah said that God sees us as as we are through His Son. And so sanctification is uh, we're practicing what we already are. We're getting to the point of who we already are in His eyes. Holiness is something we don't talk about a lot because you and I all know we're not real holy sometimes. But it's not about that. It's about His holiness in and of, in and, uh, working through us and changing us, transforming us. Okay? And what that means. Is holiness required? Yes, the Bible is very clear about that. Only the holy will inherit the kingdom of God. And go, oh, that's a problem. Well, not if the Holy Spirit lives within us, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Y'all are a great crowd. Um, hope to see you Sunday morning. Hope to see you Saturday morning. Excuse me, Saturday morning. Don't be showing up Sunday. Saturday. Then you show up. Greens and greens too. What's that? We're going to need pork nuts and greens. Okay, there's a lot of stuff back there. So if you can come Friday evening, hopefully the tent will be set up and we might go ahead and set up some tables and stuff like that. Saturday morning at 6, we'll take all the stuff out there and start getting to know some of our community. Okay? Maybe if those were pickup trucks, could, can a 
come to the ramp and we load up so at least we like a we're gonna, yeah we've got a couple of trucks and trailers uh, that should be there at six o'clock and uh, yes, and we need all the hands on deck uh, to load stuff up, to set it up out there, and there's a lot to do, uh, setting up food, different things. We have, we will have handouts. It's a little track. It kind of talks about how the world sees this time of the year, in particular Halloween and things like that, but what uh, this season and, and what we're doing, what that means in the Christian world. And Anyway, so you have some things to hand. Let me pray with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to read your word and study and to think about the fact that one day we can come home. And when we get there, we won't be struggling with self, sin, all the things that go on here on, on earth. But Father, help us not to be selfish in that endeavor. Help us not to just want to get out of the turmoil and the struggles we find ourselves in here. Help us to bring folks with us uh, in a way of sharing the gospel to them and, and being the messengers that you've uh, commissioned us to be, carrying the gospel to others, making disciples, not just preaching from the corners, but spending time, and energy, and effort to share life with others and to teach them by example the gospel and what it is to be transformed by the renewing of our minds through the Word and through the presence of your Spirit. I pray that you would be honored and glorified here at Homewood Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, 